Hello and welcome. This is the recording of an online meeting of the Surrey Region Network known as the Surrey Environmental Action Schools, or SEAS, which is a member of the UK Schools Sustainability Network, the UK SSN. The meeting is entitled Climate Anxiety to Climate Positivity, the case for staying positive when it all feels too much and what we can do to achieve this. The UK SSN is a student-led UK-wide network of schools made up of constituent area networks. This is run overall by Dr Jess Tipton and hosted by Global Action Plan. SEAS is a regional network of this and is run by myself, Phil Lehman. I'm Head of Sustainability at Cranley School, Surrey, and this meeting was hosted as part of our Eco Week 2022. The UK SSN and the constituent networks are an amazing, inspiring place for secondary students to come together to take action for the climate. And if you're interested in joining either SEAS or any other network in the UK SSN, please check out our website at www.ukssn.org.uk or email getintouch at ukssn.org.uk. We've got five wonderful speakers coming up exploring different aspects of climate anxiety and adopting a positive mindset. This seminar came out of a discussion among the C schools earlier in the year and also a request by one of our partner organisations, Zero Carbon Guildford, to create an interactive display to engage young people coming into their premises. As such, we've decided to focus on climate emotions and sharing good news. We've created a survey for young people to use and are also making an interactive website to promote our member school's positive achievement and promote climate positivity. The survey is still live and you're very welcome to take part. You can find the link early on in this video. This recording was made on Monday the 21st of March uh, 2022 and is hosted by, hosted by Rosie and Kasim, two amazing sixth form leaders and eco-prefects at Cranley School. All the intellectual property and resources belong to the relevant speakers and the recording is the property of UK SSN and Cranley School. To request to use any part of it, please contact Philip Lehman on pml at cranley.org. We really hope you enjoy it. Right, um, so I think without too much more ado, I'm going to hand you over to Rosie and Kasim. Thanks, guys. Hi, I'm Kasim, I'm one of the eco-prefects at Cranley. Yeah, I'm Rosie um, and yeah, also another eco-prefect. Um, and so firstly, I think there's a, oh yeah, I think Ms. Lehm has just put it on the like main screen, but there's a form which, uh, not a form, like a survey, um, which would be great for you to sort of fill out. Um, I think we've got three minutes to do it super quickly. I don't think it's very long, but if you could do that, that would be great. Okay, so our first speaker is Caroline Hickman, um, and she's a member of the Climate um, Psychology Alliance and lectures at the University of Bath. Um, she was one of the lead researchers on the Lancet study of the climate anxiety um, in 10,000 young people around the world um, that is so like, widely and hugely cited in the media. Um, and so we're really excited to hear what you have to say, Caroline. Thank you for inviting me. So I'm going to talk to you about eco-anxiety and talk about it as we could either think of it as a catastrophic threat to humanity or it's a transformational moment in history for humanity. So I'm going to talk about this as a journey from eco-anxiety to eco-empathy and eco-aliveness, because I think feeling this eco-anxiety is a sign that you care. You're only going to feel eco-anxiety if you care about what's happening to the planet and the environment. So we shouldn't be embarrassed. We shouldn't feel doubtful. We shouldn't worry too much about this anxiety. We shouldn't pathologize it. We should be proud of feeling this eco-anxiety. It's logical, isn't it? And we have to keep in mind that it's very much connected to the way humans are behaving. It's in connection with the environment, of course, and the planet, but it's also the way that humans are behaving around this. And Gus Beth puts it beautifully. He used to be the US advisor on climate change, and he said, he used to think with lots of good science over 30 years, we can fix the problems. He says, but I was wrong. Our top environmental problems are selfishness, greed and apathy. And to deal with that, we need these communities. We need gatherings and conversations like we're having this evening. We need spiritual and cultural transformation. And that shouldn't be left with scientists alone. We need artists. We need social scientists. We need musicians. We need everybody to be involved in this conversation. We're also living in this as it unfolds. And Paul Hoggett says, you know, we're witnessing this as it unfolds in front of our eyes. So it's no surprise that we don't always know how to respond to this. 
And we can flip between feeling hopeless and feeling hopeful. And that's what this conversation tonight is about. Because it's not all hopeless. It's not too late to change the end of the story. But we don't need naive hope. What we need is radical hope. Radical hope says, yeah, things are tough. Things are difficult. We've got to make significant changes. And we all need to stand up and be counted on this. And there's a lot we can do. Naive hope says, oh, technology will save us. The government will save us. No, it won't. We need radical hope. So we need some courage around this. And we need to remember that this is a relational issue. And we need to be in relationship with the planet as well as with other humans to achieve this. So this is a really emotionally healthy response. If you're feeling eco-anxiety, not only am I saying you should be proud because you care, but also I'm saying you should recognize that this is a healthy response. We measure mental health by looking at our capacity to respond to external reality and the world is struggling with the threats that it's facing. So it's a mentally healthy response to feel this anxiety. Yeah. And we could say it's not mentally healthy to not feel the anxiety. I would go as far as to say I think everyone on the planet has some eco-anxiety. It's just some people are not consciously aware of the fact they've got this anxiety. They're better at pushing it into the unconscious. All of these feelings, it's anxiety is often the first thing we feel, but it's also grief, hope and hopelessness. Sometimes we're going to feel hopeless. Actually, paradoxically, we need to feel hopeless in order to get back to the hope. So don't push those more complicated feelings away. Sometimes we need to feel some anger, some frustration, some guilt and shame, sadness and grief. Allow all of these feelings, allow this emotional biodiversity. That is what gives us the emotional resilience that we need. And we need this internal emotional activism as well as external activism. And what you can see is by letting this mixture of feelings come through you and be part of all of the action that you take, it gives you that radical acceptance and helps you move forward with resilience in a way that is sustainable. So this is about building sustainable activism. It's strange, isn't it, that feeling sad or feeling depressed or feeling hopeless is an important part of this, but it gives us the compost for sustainable activism. This was the research that you referenced. Thank you. So this is us making this link between environmental pay feelings of pain and distress that young people are having, the emotions and the cognition, the thinking, and saying, well, OK, so you're not mentally ill. We think these feelings make perfect sense. I feel them too. But we also need to acknowledge and name that suffering and that struggle. And we wanted to say that this was a form of moral injury. So this is people in power failing to do the right thing. And so we need to call them out on this and say, we don't need treatment for eco-anxiety. What we need is to have these feelings validated, recognized, understood. And we need people in power to act on this. Because this was one of the findings in our survey that I think was the worst finding worldwide and in the UK, when children and young people tried to talk about climate change, they felt dismissed or ignored. 48% told us this. This we could change tomorrow, couldn't we? And tonight, because this is linking climate change with human rights, that we would argue subjecting young people to this anxiety without validating it and without recognizing it, and then telling them, telling you that it's your problem if you're feeling this and there's something wrong with you, that's cruel. It's inhuman, it's degrading, and it's torture. And this is a human rights issue. Because the truth is, to be human, to be fully human in the world, right, means we've got to accept being vulnerable. So back to my main argument, if you've got feelings of eco-anxiety, it's because you care. So you should be proud that you care. And we need to care in order to take action. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was really interesting. Uh, really loved how you mentioned about the resilience and how like subtle like feelings that we usually dismiss, like frustration and anger, mm. like empower us to help us through. I also found the fact actually that fifty percent of young people feel like their sort of climate anxiety just gets dismissed. I think that's a really intriguing thing to sort of reflect on. That's I think that's the one that makes me most cross because yeah. we could change that like 
now. To, yeah. You know, we don't need technology. We just need to have these conversations and respect how young people feel. Yeah. Um, are there any questions? I think there's some hands up. If there's any uh, hands up or you can text it in the chat and we'll reply that way. Yeah, they can text them in the chat and I can answer them as we go on. I don't um, think there are at the moment, but... So there's no... Oh, oh there's yeah. one raised hand. Sorry, it's me being annoying. Um, I was just wondering whether your research looked into at all what the reasons for why the... Uh, you know, if, if a child comes to an adult and wants to talk about their anxiety, mm. did your research go into why adults are shutting it down? Is it a disbelief? Is it actually their own sort of not wanting to admit it because that's scary? Did you look into that at all? We, we didn't with the quantitative research, but I have in my qualitative research through the university, which I've been doing for eight years. Um, and the reasons, it's a mixture of reasons. It's a very good question. It's often uh, adults' guilt and shame and feeling helpless and hopeless themselves and struggling to hear the pain and distress of young people. You know, adults, parents, we want, and teachers, we want our children to have happy, healthy lives. And listening to the frustration and the anger and the despair can be really difficult. But actually, I, I spoke to a lot of children and young people as well as parents about this. And what children and young people say to me is they need adults to tell the truth. They need adults to have courage and tell the truth and not pretend that it's not that bad. But also not just focus on the negatives, focus on the negatives and then the positives. I asked a lot of children, how do we talk to you about this? And they said, I'm going to quote Sophia. I have to use her name. She gets cross if I don't. She said, tell us the truth. She said, because if you don't tell us the truth, you're lying to us. And if you lie to us, we can't tell you how we feel and we can't trust you. She said, but don't tell us all the bad news all at once. Tell us some good, then some bad, then some good, then some bad. She said, and anyway, she said, uh, I'm not a baby. She was eight at the time. I love the girl. I wish she was running the world. Um, it's about having those courageous conversations, not pretending it's not happening, deal with our own guilt, say sorry to young people. I say sorry to young people all the time and not leave them to face this on their own. Because between us intergenerationally, we've got the amazing, innovative, creative ideas from young people, but we've also got the wisdom and the responsibility of the older generation working together. It's a very powerful combination. Yeah, I think Mr. Lehman. Mr. Lehman's got also... one question. Um, <laughs> sure. question Caroline, in your, um, in your your research that's been kind of so widely kind of cited in the news and and, and you know yeah, and those sort of thing. Did was there a? I just wondered what the different experiences of children across the world was. How kind of profound was that? And I I do feel sometimes that with some of the yeah. kids school here in a kind of leafy, lovely part of the country where everything is quite nice. It feels the climate crisis feels quite remote sometimes. And yeah. Children across the other side of the world had a very different view. That's a brilliant question. I'm so glad you asked me. One of the things that's really um, powerful about that research was we asked about emotional response. We asked about cognition, thinking. How does it make you think? And we asked about the impact on daily living. And when we looked at the figures, the response around emotion, Say, for example, the children in the UK were pretty much identical to the children in Brazil, in the Philippines, in India, where the children and young people are right on the forefront, right on the front line of the climate emergency. So emotionally, we saw a really, really similar response. And cognitively, the thoughts like, you know, we don't have a good future, people have failed to take care of the planet, very similar response. So I would interpret that as the children and young people in Europe are well informed and care very similarly. The where we saw an enormous difference, and this is what you're asking about, was the impact on daily living. So for example, 28% of children in the UK felt it had an impact on their daily living, which is eating, sleeping, going to school, playing, enjoying their lives but 74% of children in the Philippines and India, it had an impact on their daily living. So that's the massive difference. The 
way it affects us emotionally is very similar because we care emotionally. But in terms of living our lives and being able to enjoy our lives, it's not impacting in Europe nearly as much as it is, obviously, if you're living in the Philippines or India. And I think that's the really significant difference. Does that make sense? And that's where we really have to pay attention because as things get worse, we're going to see the impact on being able to live your life, go to school, to have friends, to do those things. That will incrementally get worse in Europe as well as things get worse. And it should motivate us to say sorry and to take steps to reduce carbon emissions because that's the only way we can help children and young people in the Philippines, in India, in Nigeria, in the Maldives, because they haven't caused the carbon emissions that are leading to the global heating and the sea level rise, but they are the ones paying the price. So that's where it makes perfect sense to address this as an issue of global injustice. That's what we can do about that. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, so yeah. let's move on to the next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Hannah Hooper. Hannah is a climate activist and pro and the programs and partnerships intern at Force of Nature, the amazing organization set out to empower young people to turn eco anxiety into agency. She is passionate, and the intersection between mental health, well being, and nature is very important to her. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Um, so my name is Hannah and I'm the Programs and Partnerships Intern at Force of Nature. And at the core of what we do at Force of Nature is work with young people to support them to move from a place of hopelessness and anxiety in the face of the climate crisis to a place of empowerment and agency. And we're doing this by offering really exciting trainings and workshops for young people in our community and beyond. And we believe it's essential that young people have a seat at the table offering their solutions to the climate crisis in an intergenerational dialogue. So the climate crisis can feel like this insurmountable challenge to take on. And for many young people, it's the mental barriers, whether that be imposter syndrome or limiting beliefs and a fear at the state of the world that stops them from taking action. But it is these young people who have the solutions. And we believe that it is young people who need the seat at the table to offer their ideas and the solutions to the climate crisis. So we often find that the biggest barrier to taking action are these self-limiting beliefs. So for example, I'm not smart enough to take action on this issue. I'm not qualified enough. The issue is too big. You know, I'm not a climate scientist. But what we forget is that we all need to take meaningful action and we can do this by exploring what our why is and speaking to our own experiences. So finding your why is the route to creating meaningful change and rising up rather than shutting down in the face of the climate crisis. That along with knowing your values and the influence that you want to create will come from this why. So when we rise up and face up this adversity, we prove to ourselves that we can take action utilizing our emotions to propel us forward. So no action is too small to make a difference. There's a lot of pressure being put on young people to fix the problem and it's only making things like eco-anxiety more prevalent. How can we feel ready to act when uh, we feel as individuals that we are not making enough of a difference in the face of the multitude of influences that are causing so much harm to the planet? And for young people, this is really difficult to manage. It's this fear of not doing enough due to the pressure being put on only individual action and feeling the weight of the issue on their shoulders that really stop these young people from taking action. I also experienced this uh, debilitating feeling not too long ago. And although I am still facing eco-anxiety and fears about the climate crisis, Rather than feeling shut down by my emotions, I choose to feel empowered by them. Our emotions are kind of like our superpowers and they show us that we have empathy and that we care about the issue at hand, which is very much what Caroline was speaking to. And rather than pushing these emotions down, I learned to lean into them. And it was through realizing that I shouldn't be ashamed of having these emotions and actually I can use them to catalyze to create action. 
And this is where I really discovered my why and my reason for taking action towards the climate crisis. So it is our emotions which are the foundations of these movements. And we can create radical change by following these emotions and leaning into them in a safe space and through engaging with other young people on this journey. I really see my emotional capacity to this crisis as a really important aspect of my activist work and what makes me feel uncomfortable and how I choose to move through it rather than kind of scuttling around it has really served me on my journey. And at Force of Nature, we really believe that emotions are what catalyze us to take action. And it's through taking action, we are able to move through eco-anxiety and really, yeah, take action. And since working at Force of Nature, I've really realized the importance of my why. I believe that it is through this and my reason to act that I was able to take action even through feelings of eco-anxiety and ecophobia. So I'm gonna just share quickly about what my why is and why I'm so passionate about taking action towards the climate crisis. And this is due to connecting with nature. My experience with nature is really, really deeply rooted in daily connection. And during lockdown, I was lucky enough to have nature on my doorstep and to take daily walks and interact with my surroundings. And this was the start of a practice which really stayed with me and has not only served my mental and emotional well-being, but has also had a huge impact on the way I relate to nature. From becoming aware of the seasons around me and to the sounds of nature drowning out the sounds of the city, to the physiological impact of being in nature, which it has on my body, including you know, reducing stress or bringing that sense of inner clarity. But sadly, a lot of people are losing access to these natural spaces and especially in cities. And as someone who lives in a city, I have found connecting with nature imperative to my well-being. And through this connection with nature, I believe we develop a sense of empathy for the natural world. And from my own experience, I've found that there is this disconnect is one of the reasons people find it hard to feel called to action in the face of the climate crisis, because that thread of connection has been severed. That along with feelings of imposter syndrome and not feeling equipped to take action makes the climate crisis feel really overwhelming. However, through those daily walks and being in nature, I remembered what it is I am fighting for, and that was building connections with the natural world. When I decided I wanted to contribute towards solving the climate crisis, I felt a lot of this imposter syndrome, the main ones being, you know, I'm not a climate scientist or I'm not someone with a big social platform to share my voice, which is something that is, um, I think, really prevalent among the younger generation is having this big platform and if I don't have that then what's the point in even speaking to these things but it wasn't until I realized what my why was that I felt I was able to take action and what inspires us to take action doesn't have to be large scale it can be a simple moment from your life that made you think differently that inspired you to take action so no matter what your why is let that be your driving force for creating change you know, mine's simply connecting with nature. It's not to end all fast fashion or rally to, you know, bring down these big corporations. And although that's kind of important, my why comes from personal experiences and what's meaningful to me in my personal life is also something which I know I can do within my day-to-day -day life and my community. And from this place, I feel inspired to take action because I know the action I'm taking, such as speaking to you today and speaking from this place of sincere passion and care is a form of taking action. So I may not have all the qualifications and I don't know the ins and outs of climate science, but I have a why for taking action. So with all that being said, I invite you to consider your why or your catalyst moment to fight for the earth we inhabit. Perhaps you may not currently know what your why is, but I invite you to think to a time that really stood out to you in relation to nature or the climate. A moment that really sticks in your mind is influential. And no matter how big or small that is, let this be your anchor for creating change. Thank you. Thank you so much. I thought that was so interesting, especially about like using your emotions to sort of empower you, not to let them be um, 
sort of a big, not to let them make you more anxious, but using them sort of for beneficial reasons. Um, I don't know if anyone's got any questions. Should we just wait a little bit to see? I think. Got a raised hand. If not, I think there are just lots of thank yous. <laughs> um, okay, well, perfect. Um, thank you so much. And I think we'll move on to the next speaker. Um, oh, if anyone has any questions, you can pop them in the chat just in case you miss you. Yeah. And we'll come back to them later on. Do you want to introduce uh, that? Okay. Um, so, okay, so now we're really looking forward to um, introducing or welcoming um, two representatives from our local heroes, which is Zero Carbon Guildford. Um, who are blazing a trail in community engagement in Surrey. Um, it's out of our work designing an interactive display um, for Zero that our current sort of focus on climate positivity has emerged. Um, and so to speak a bit more about it is Francis Torza, I think that's right, and Ella Gardner, um, who both volunteer at Zero's community centre. Um, yeah, so we're really looking forward to what you have to say. All right, thanks. Um... And unfortunately, you just have me this evening because Ella couldn't make it. It seems like her internet never got working. So lucky you. <laughs> um, before I, I go into what Zero is about, I'm curious how many of you are actually close to Guilford? Like if you just want to put in the chat like me or, or not me, then I'm just because I'm kind of curious just what the demographic is. Yeah, so that makes sense. Brighton. I'm still, I'm, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm not from around here. So I'm still learning the geography of, of the UK. So is Brighton far from here? Not too far. Okay. Hour, hour and a half. So I'm, I don't know how many of you have heard of the initiative of uh, Zero Carbon Guilford. Um, it really is brand new. Um, it was started up officially in December of 2020 um, by a guy named Ben, who is very humble. And whenever he's talking about it, he makes it sound like it was the work of everybody else. But he's like, he's the one who kind of had the initial idea and got his friends together and started working with the Guilford Environmental Forum, which was the organization in charge at the time. Um, and got working with the Guilford Borough Council trying to um, get a community center. Um, to kind of talk about the current environmental crisis and what people can do about it. And, and if you ever get a chance to go to the Zero Carbon Guilford uh, Community Center, um, probably 90% of the things around there he built. So <laughs> he, he had a huge hand in that. And uh, I the only thing I can say is that I painted one of the signs <laughs> and that I'm a volunteer there. Um, and yeah, the whole mission of Zero Carbon Guilford is to push for the borough of Guilford to be carbon neutral by 2030. And they're doing that through a lot of different initiatives. They're doing it through um, uh, promoting zero waste by having a zero waste shop. Um, they have a community fridge to try to reduce food waste. Uh, they have a vegan cafe where you can get coffee, tea, or a really thick cookie or brownie and just hang out in the area. And then there's different options for getting in touch with other groups that are trying to work to make um, Guilford more green. Um, and right now, one of the things we're doing is a well-being um, seminar, which is on Friday mornings at 1030. Um, it's about an hour long, and it's basically going over the different things um, like mindfulness and how to deal with your anxiety and um, things like that. There's actually another event that's coming up that's talking about, um, it's, it's tomorrow and it's online as well if you're interested in going to the uh, Zero Carbon Guilford website and uh, registering for it, it's completely free, um, about can sustainable behavior make you feel better? And uh, so it's oh, things like that that we're trying to promote because as speaking for myself, I know it is pretty easy to get um, overwhelmed and to try to take on too much. Um, I, I think it was Caroline's, uh, one of Caroline's slides had the different figures on it. And there was one that kind of went off to the um, bottom where it's like, I will do this if it kills me. And 
I, I will admit that I've, I've been guilty of that a couple of times where it's like I was trying to take on so much, uh, trying to do so much because I didn't think I was doing enough. And I had to be kind of talked off the ledge by like, you, you can only do so much because you're one person and it's, and it's don't feel hopeless that you can only do so much because that's all you can do. Um, and it does help to talk about it. I will admit it does help to express your feelings. Um, and, and letting yourself feel that way a couple of times, part of the mindfulness is to not necessarily push aside what you're feeling, but be aware of it and really kind of study it and breathe through it and analyze it. And that can kind of help you to move on from that. And I will also say that I've, I've learned through experience that it's really easy to get angry at others for not doing enough. But you, you're allowed to be angry, but then you'll have to learn to forgive. Forgive them for not doing enough or forgive yourself if you feel like you're not doing enough because otherwise you just hold on to the resentment and that just kind of eats you up inside. So, but yeah, the different zero events are uh, all working towards uh, trying to help people feel empowered to go out there and do what they can. So it's about sums it up. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really nice and inspiring to hear. Um, have we got any more questions? Uh, any questions? I read somewhere that it takes the brain about 27 seconds to formulate a question, so oh, I, I, I... 27 <laughs> seconds then. Yeah. I will not be surprised if we don't hear anything until like two minutes later. We can, always, if you have any questions, me. We can always, always put them on the chat, and I'm sure at the end um, we'll come back there'll be time. Them, yeah. yeah, we'll come back to any questions. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, I'm going to introduce the fourth speaker. We're now really excited to hear from Helen Forrester. She's, um, Helen is an ex-English teacher from South London who lives not too far away in Brighton. She runs an outdoor writing classes in local woodlands and creates nature-inspired creative writing prompts as well as the popular podcast Prompted by Nature. Her work focuses on the intersections between nature and creativity and how we can use this in the latter to take positive action whilst utilizing mindfulness practices to stay focused on the good things. Helen, we're really excited to hear from you and what you've got. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, first of all, I was saying at the beginning, I'm a little bit poorly, so my brain's a bit foggy. So if I stumble on my words, I apologize. So um, yeah, so I have quite a like roundabout the way sort of thing that I do so I um my kind of small business if you like is called prompted by nature and I spend a lot of time working with groups um in woodlands doing writing classes and courses generally nature writing because it, you're in a woodland of course you're going to write about nature um but I as um as the guy said I'm uh, an ex-English teacher and uh, I was doing that for 10 years, came out of it four and a half years and actually Prompted by Nature came out of lockdown. It was, I was at home teaching my kids, um, well, homeschooling them, they're six and eight now. Um, and so my creativity, which I've always been quite a creative person um, and writing is how it kind of expresses itself in me. For some people it's art, for some people it's music. But for me, it's always been words and writing. And I think um, during lockdown, my creativity kind of surged after having been very, very tired from a, a long career in teaching. It sort of started to come back. Everything was quiet. We could go out for walks and things like that. And um, it started, I started to kind of think about um, how, how, nature and my own creativity are linked and the ways in which they almost it started to feel like they were almost relying on each other like my connection to nature is deepened because of the way that I the the, the way that my creativity comes through my creativity is deepened by my connection by with nature and so um that was kind of where the podcast came out of and it also came out of like we've been talking about obviously eco-anxiety I don't know about the kind of older members of the group here, but I know that it's something I felt for a very, very long time. I was born in the eighties and I remember all of the CFCs and the ozone layer hole and everything like that. And so 
it felt like now that I had this time to um, just kind of get a bit quiet, it was like, well, how, how am I actually going to do something about that? Um, so anyway, um, one of the things that I kind of wanted to talk about this evening was um, something that actually came out of one of the conversations I had with one of the creatives that I spoke with. So the podcast, I speak to nature. So people who work creatively in and with nature. So it's like whether that's um, activists or permaculture experts or artists or writers, whatever it is. And one of them, um, she's a writer. She actually lives kind of in the north of the South Downs. She lives in the South Downs, but like the north bit. Um, and she talked about something called creative conservation, which I was really interested in because sometimes when we talk about, oh, oh I'm going to do a picture that represents how I'm feeling about climate breakdown or I'm going to write about it. It almost feels like we're not doing anything. It's like it's a bit of a self, it's a bit of an indulgence to sit and write about it. You know, that kind of idea of navel gazing. But she put it in a really nice way where she was talking about how, you know, how do we find out about about the climate crisis how are these stories told well they're they're told through creativity they're told through and with creativity you know the films that are made the books that are written the pieces of artwork you know if you go to a protest look at the amount of incredibly creative boards and placards that are held up by people all of this is a way of um engaging with what's going on in a way that almost feels a little bit more manageable and it's it's any it's really anything but pedestrian because uh, I really liked what Caroline was talking about, Caroline, when you when you were talking about you know acknowledging the eco anxiety, acknowledging the fear, and I think that for me writing is something that helps me deal with that anxiety because I can write it out. Like I've written the apocalypse probably about fifty times <laughs> because sometimes it sounds a bit morbid, but sometimes I have to write down my worries and my concerns so that then that always turns into well well what's after that or what do we have now which shows that actually we're not going down that path we're not too far down that you know look at all the positives that are there write about your walk to work where you can or school where all you can hear is bird song because for for just a moment there's no traffic noise and you can hear the bird song or the caterpillar that you saw whatever it might be um and so that kind of forms very much like like in the writing uh classes that I do it's very much about just being in nature and letting your creativity come through that just sitting and being in it and enjoying it because it's it's not like we're enjoying it while it's here we're enjoying it because it's here and that will lead us to hopefully want to take some kind of action but I think in order to sometimes, in order to move towards the action, which can be quite scary, you know, it can be scary to, like we said, you know, that that sense of shame that I think is still there when, when you talk about environmental issues, a lot of people will gaslight you, a lot of people will just, oh, just not want to talk about it, as Caroline kind of said, and I think allowing your creativity to be like the first step you're writing your art whatever be the first step towards taking some kind of action and not feeling feeling guilty because actually we need creativity because it's all it's like um it is it the antithesis like the antithesis of destruction like in order to create you have to destroy something and what you're destroying in order to create you know it's that kind of circular thing but um what i thought i would do rather than sitting here waffling on about how amazing it is to create using nature as a prompt, which is literally all I do, um, because it's a really lovely thing to do. What I thought what I, I would do, because part of, also part of what I do is I'm an ex yoga and meditation teacher. So I spent years learning how to meditate and teaching other people to do it. So I thought um, I'll guide you through a mindfulness practice, if that's okay. Uh, feel free to turn your cameras off if you want, if you don't wanna sit and close your eyes. But um, this is something that I often use at the beginning of my sessions, because the most important thing about being in uh, a place where you're going to create or you would like to create is to actually get you into that state. So what I uh, 
offer to you to do is just to sit comfortably, doesn't matter how you're sitting, you don't have to be in lotus position, and close your eyes. And just kind of rearrange your body until it's comfortable. And maybe just take a few really deep breaths, because sometimes that's just what you need to do. So breathing in through the nose. Open your mouth and breathe out. And just do a couple more of those. And every time you exhale, just really feel as if the muscles in your face are relaxing and like it's almost like water cascading down and everything it touches, all of the muscles it touches are just releasing. So the shoulders are dropping, the belly is becoming loose and you're just really feeling uh, connected to whatever you're sitting on. So it's taking your weight and it's okay for you to just release for a few moments. So just start to notice the inhalation and the exhalation. Maybe saying, I am inhaling, I am exhaling to yourself internally. And then start to count down from 10 to 1. It could be with the breath, it could just be 10 nine, eight, seven, all the way down to one. And then when you get to one, just become aware of your feet. And we'll just do a very brief body scan. So taking all of your awareness to your feet, <clears throat> your ankles, your lower legs, your upper legs, your hips, and then just allow your awareness to go all the way up the body until it reaches the top of the head. And then as it reaches the top of your head, just come back to the breath. I am inhaling. I am exhaling. And then start to bring the awareness to your sense of sound. So everything that you can hear. The sounds close to you and the sounds further away and just allow the sense of sound to move out further and further away from the body until you're listening out for sounds that are maybe the other side of the room, the other side of the building, maybe outside. And just noticing those sounds. And then bring the awareness to the sense of touch and feel. Notice, so if you were sitting outside, you might be noticing the breeze on your face, the sun on your head. It might be that you notice the floor underneath your feet or the seat underneath your legs. Allowing the seat to take your body weight again. And then come back to the breath. I am inhaling. I am exhaling. Slowly start to deepen the breath. Sending the breath all the way down to the bottom of the, the, bottom of the lungs and filling up all the way to the top. And then let the breath come out through the nose, nice and slowly. <clears throat> nice, gentle, soft inhalations and exhalations. And then when you feel ready, bring one hand to the other and start to rub the palms together just to wake your body back up.
You can place the hands over the eyes if you want to, keep the eyes closed underneath. And then open the eyes underneath the hands. And then when you feel ready, take the hands away. And come back into the room. So usually do when I do that with groups, um, we use all five senses because <clears throat> we'll be outside. Um, and yeah, it's just a really nice way to uh, create like a, a, a real beginning to the session so that whatever you've come with, you just leave it there and then you're in a creative space wherever you are. Um, and yeah, just allowing yourself to have time for that, that kind of guilt free time to create and uh, write or draw whatever it is um, using the nature that you have in front of you, uh, which might be your garden or the street, whatever it might be. Um, yeah. <laughs> Snooze, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really enjoyed that mindfulness, like sort of like centered me back down. And I really enjoyed when you talked about like the positives of writing or just being around nature. It was really nice. Oh, you're welcome. I'm sorry I waffled. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't, don't worry. It's very interesting. <laughs> Shall we wait for questions or um, like very quick wait? You can wait 27 seconds. 27 seconds, yes. I think we'll, I think we'll just keep going. And then again, if we'll check the chat questions, after. Yeah, just check the chat. Um, so I think our final speaker, I believe, is um, da uh, Mr. Dan O'Hare. Um, and he's an educational psychologist lecturer at the University of Bristol and also a current um, co-vice chair of the Division of Educational and Child Psychology and part of the British, part, oh, part of the British Psychological Society. Um, his main interests are in how to effectively communicate psychology and how educational um, child psychologists have responded to the climate crisis. Um, he runs um, edsci.org.uk um, which is an online magazine for anyone who's interested in education or psychology. So um, I think please go onto that website. Um, and so I think we're really interested in hearing from you. Thanks. That's a good plug. Thanks very much. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I was anxious to go last. I think it's, you know, certainly seeing the speaker list uh, and thinking, oh, my goodness, you know, there's there's a lot of experienced people here. Um it struck me there, Rosie, I think, when you said about, um, you know, how educational and child psychologists have responded to the climate crisis, because the answer is, is not very well, really. Um, so it's a really sort of fantastic opportunity for me to be able to, to speak this evening. So thank you very much, firstly, for the invite. Um, my colleague in the British Psychological Society sort of sent the invite through and, and, and asked about, you know, climate anxiety, climate positivity, what... Um, is this something I want to talk about? Is that something I want to do? So I thought, yeah, you know, wh why not? And, and I was thinking today about what we should discuss, like in 15 minutes. And um, I'm currently writing a paper thinking about introducing some of the ideas and some of the key research about how climate breakdown is affecting children and young people. And, and that paper is specifically for educational psychologists. Um, and it's been a really interesting journey in that I know that many of my colleagues have been talking um, for some time now about the increasing number of children and young people who are saying that they're feeling worried, anxious, hopeless, powerless about the, 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 the changes to the environment and the climate that they're seeing. Um, and there's a quote that I had on one of these slides uh, from um, McBride in, in 2021. So McBride is actually the, I think, chief executive of the Early Intervention Foundation. Uh, a government body set up by the Department for Education to look at um, how to really prevent issues before they become a problem. Um, and I think he was asked to write about uh, eco-anxiety and, and climate anxiety. And the quote from his blog really struck it st stuck out for me. And, and, and he says that, and it very much mirrors what Caroline was saying earlier. So eco-anxiety is better understood as a societal problem of accountability and empathy rather than of individual pathology. Um, and that last bit there, individual pathology in that, you know, as we've heard, if you're experiencing that anxiety or worry or grief or stress, it's not a problem with you in that sense. It's very much about 
you know, what has or hasn't been done previously. And as Karen and I said, do, is, is there a willingness from adults and those in power to listen to that and, and understand that experience? So I thought I just wanted to use that quote again as, as to, to kind of set the scene for, for my talk here, as others have, have, have done so well. The second thing that I, I wanted to think about was this notion of, of you not being alone if you're feeling this. And that message has come, uh, come across strongly as well. But particularly for children and young people, um, some of you might be aware, actually, that in 2020, the Children's Commissioner, um, so that's an office uh, that's really meant to be looking at how the UK governments can implement the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Children. That's really why the Children's Commissioner's office was set up. And in 2020, the Children's Commissioner did a piece of research called The Big Ask, uh, where they wanted to find out from children and young people what mattered most to them in their life. And, and actually 500,000 children responded to this survey from across the UK, um, oh, sorry, from, from England, because it was an, 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 an England survey. And the report that followed on from that questionnaire was called The Big Answer. Um, and so, you know, if you think about that's half a million children and young people were filled in that survey. And, and just another quote here from the Children's Commissioner's Office, they said that when children were asked what they were most worried about, the environment was an overwhelming priority. And that comes out really strongly in the findings from the big answer. Um, and I think that notion of, of, of knowing that you're not alone is really key and really powerful. And that kind of takes us into sort of um, the, the next part of, 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 of what I'd want to talk about, which is, you know, it's kind of climate anxiety. Okay, fine. But what, what can you do? And we've had some fantastic examples already of ways that we can respond to, acknowledge, validate, understand that emotional experience. Um, so I've got sort of, you know, Phil gave me the very anxiety provoking <laughs> sort of task of, of top tips, which is always, I don't know, as an educational psychologist, I always rebel against because it's not my place to give tips, but I, I, I embraced it anyway. Um, and, you know, we've heard the first one already, haven't we, about acknowledging the feelings that we're experiencing. And Caroline's list of, of sort of emotional diversity, I thought was fantastic. Guilt, shame, powerlessness, display, uh, hope, hopelessness. Um, and I think there's often a focus on taking action. And sometimes that taking action can be at the expense of sitting with and understanding that emotion that we're feeling at that time. Um, so these ideas, these tips, I think, hopefully are directed at, at particularly the children and young people here um, this evening. Um, but really sitting with and allowing those emotions, recognizing them, labeling them, labeling emotions is a powerful, is sort of a powerful tool in itself. So, so you know, tip number one, we've heard about already. And, and if some of this acts as a summary, great. Repetition is never a bad thing. Um, but yeah, hopefully that's, hopefully that's come across strongly this evening about acknowledging your, your feelings. Tip number two, then, something that, that, that I've thought about is being really specific about about your feelings or why you're feeling those feelings. So let's say it's stress. You've identified it as stress. I think the next step is about being specific about where that stress is coming from. That emotion and the whole issue of sort of climate breakdown or, or, or the environmental crisis can be really overwhelming. And it can be a useful step to kind of recognize or try to puzzle out or work the way through. So where is this stress coming from? Is it about, for example, harm to animals that I've seen? Is it about recent reporting about extreme weather in another part of the globe or, or at home here, you know, two weeks ago, Storm Eunice? Is it about not feeling listened to? And actually spending time kind of working out the specificities around that stress can be helpful in, in possibly plotting out a journey towards action. So if it's about harm to animals, the actions that you might then end up taking might be different than if your stress or your, your, your anger is about not being listened to. So actually, you know, once you recognize those feelings, trying to drill down into where they're coming from or what's what's creating them, I think might be quite useful. The next tip, then, I think, is about balancing your news. Um, so we've heard about this already. Um, you know, there is so much doom and gloom out there, um, uh, in, you know, whether it be uh, mainstream sort of news outlets or, you know, the typical doom scrolling that I am definitely a victim of, you know, get on Twitter and you just can't stop following threads about how, how terrible things are. And, and I certainly experienced this about a year ago. And I suppose it's, you know, it might feel indulgent, but I think it's important to recognize that you can make choices about the news you consume. And some of those can be proactive choices. So, um, very much found myself in a, in a doom scrolling spiral. Um, 
and then happened to go on 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 a holiday in in Devon, staying in this little cottage attached to a house, and they'd left this magazine there. And and I don't work for this magazine, by the way, but so I will say its name. But this isn't an advert. And um, so it was the Resurgence magazine, Resurgence and Ecologist. And I just happened to pick it up, and it was such a breath of fresh air to see that actually this was a news outlet you know a physical a physical magazine that was really communicating a range of fantastic positive action that was happening in the UK and around the world where people were taking action in very very small local communities or pioneering projects that then had a global reach and it was such a different type of climate and environment news than what i was used to from from twitter or from the main the main sort of media outlets so I think balancing your news is really important. So, you know, taking choices to, I think there's a website called Information is Beautiful. And on there, they have a news stream, which is, is all about good news, but good news represented in beautiful and in-depth graphics. And just to browse through that can really give you a sense of actually it isn't all doom and gloom. Not that we ignore the doom and gloom, but actually making active choices to that, that certainly for me has benefited my well-being might be a powerful sort of course of action we can take then you're already doing the next bit fantastically, right? So connecting with others, um, connecting with like-minded people, people who can share, you, you know, and understand what you're thinking and talking about. And I think from a psychological perspective, um, you know, this idea of connecting with others can fulfill that need to belong. So, so there's a, a psychologist and a researcher from, called uh, Baumeister who says that this need to belong is a fundamental human need. Um, and it's not just about belonging to to one particular group based on, you know, characteristics like, I don't know, ethnicity or age, but actually belonging to a group based on our needs, based on our interests, our passions. And, and this is something you, you, you're clearly already doing. Then I sort of talked about, you know, perhaps a top tip might be talking to others. Again, you know, tonight, a, a perfect example. Talking is, is powerful and can have many different effects. So it normalizes a conversation, a conversation that can often be quite difficult for some people. Um, you know, I, I love that graph, that uh, path to transition that Caroline showed, you know, where you, there's, there's options there, option points and decision points where one might be, overwhelmed and you might move into denial and suddenly as a young person you're having a conversation with someone who, who who just can't talk about this sort of stuff or isn't ready to talk about this sort of stuff um so normalizing the conversation is useful but talking can also create change so in the paper i'm writing there's a fascinating study from 2019 that, that happened in the us that demonstrated that children can foster climate change concern among their parents just by talking about it um interestingly this effect was most pronounced for uh, if daughters spoke to their Republican fathers, <laughs> for some reason, the effect was even more pronounced. Um, but this was a really striking finding that actually, you know, I reflected on on my childhood. Um, and that was when uh, curbside and household recycling came in. Um, I, I grew up in southeast London. And maybe it was sort of 2000 and God, I'm just trying to think, 2000, 2001, that the recycling started. You know, now we, it's just commonplace, isn't it? The green and green and brown bins outside your house and you, know, you have to sort out your recycling. But at the time, it was a big change. And I remember specifically my parents not being into this at all, but, but me being very much into the, the idea of recycling. And now when I go home, it's just standard. You know, my dad, very anti. No, I'm not wasting my time. No, no, no. Now he's, you know, it's in the wrong bin. It's in the wrong bag. You know, he's taken that role at home. So that idea of talking, creating change, particularly children talking to adults and parents is backed up by research as well. So I think that was a really powerful sort of message for me to reflect on as a, as a psychologist. The last point then is 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 connected to what um, Francis and, and Helen um, and Hannah have been talking about, which is taking action. Um, and taking action is important, but that's quite a big notion, right? Taking action. What what sort of action? Um, specific action, I think, is 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 key, and this connects back to us being specific about why we're feeling particular emotions. So, if we are feeling powerless because no one's listening, then maybe our action should be about community voice or or you know dissemination of, of of local research this specific action i think is important because it helps us to see locally as well as globally so you know whether that's specific action in our households or in our schools or community networks there might be a view that you know oh my goodness 
look at Greta Thunberg. You know, that's that's action at a global level. That's the that you know that's that's one person, and and that's that's not the whole story for sort of climate and environmental action. It, it, you know, there's a tapestry of work, isn't there, at very very local levels that's making a difference and making a change. And so I think that action at a local level can also be be particularly helpful. Um, but I think also, you know, the, the caveat I wanted to give there is that, remember that point about balance news, I think balance with action is really important as well, remembering balance. So the Australian Psychological Society talked about how an overemphasis on action can leave you vulnerable to climate related burnout. You know, we only have so many hours, you're doing your curriculums, your exams, your revision, you know, you're participating in this out of hours. It is okay to have a day off. It is okay to have fun as well. And that's essential for our, for our well-being. So yes, act, but remember to balance. Um, and I just wanted to leave with a final quote. So this is from a, an American philosopher and writer and historian, Howard Zinn. Um, and this is about sort of our, our, our frame, really, our frame of reference for how we can see what we're doing. And Howard Zinn says, if we see only the worst, it destroys our capacity to do something. If we remember those times and places, and there are so many where people have behaved magnificently, this gives us the energy to act, and at least the possibility of sending this spinning top of a world in a different direction. And I'll just leave it there. So thank you, thank you very much. And I'm sorry my slides didn't work. Um, thank you so much. That was um, really, really interesting, um, especially about sort of uh, climate anxiety being um, young people's sort of main worry um, at the moment and um, when you last said at the end about sort of don't let don't let yourself sort of burn out and you've got to almost step back sometimes and not let it control everything that you're sort of doing at the moment um, yes I thought that was a really um, inspiring thing to finish on so thank you very much and thanks Rosie thanks cousin a quick uh, thank you to all of our amazing speakers tonight we really appreciate you spending your time to come out and speak to us and I'm going to hand back to uh, Mr. Lehman now. Yes, I think he's got other plans. Just, I'd love to echo that. I, isn't it wonderful how things all seem to come together in a very synchronous way? Um, that the things that were said at the end backed up the things that were said earlier on, you know, all said from Caroline's uh, uh, research. And oh, yeah, it's amazing and really inspiring. Thank you so much to all of you. Um, Helen, thank you for your wonderful. Um, uh, little excerpt of uh, mindfulness and meditation now. I found that incredibly grounding. It was lovely. Uh, oh, yes. Actually, that's prompted me, Francis. With Carbon Zero, it's such a kind of transformative and amazing place. Uh, do you find people coming in and talking to you and saying, this place is inspiring us? It's changing how we're behaving around, around town, at home, in our daily lives? Um. You get a mix. You get people who are coming in just like, I have no idea what this is. You get people who are coming in because they heard about it from somebody else. And generally, the people leave with kind of a positive feeling and like, a, oh, yeah, I'm interested. And you'll, you'll start to see them come back and try and get more information or just hang out in the area and see what, you know, what's going on. Um, I personally haven't encountered this, but there's been one or two instances of people coming in and then trying to, of course, like, deny everything and um, say, no, this isn't, you're making a big deal out of this, and actually this and this and this, like, it's one of those issues of, uh, you know, misinformation, and how do you, how do you talk to somebody who's kind of in that zone of, no, I'm not going to listen to anything, I just, this is what I believe, and that, and nothing's going to change me, so it's one of those things where you just have to say, okay, well, thank you for coming in, so, <laughs> And uh, but yeah, for the for the most part, it does seem like the people who come in are um, are positive about it, and they do like what they're seeing, and they think it's a good idea. Um, I've not had anybody tell me I'm going to change now, uh, but I think there's again, there's been people who said that um, they've had really good conversations with people coming in, and that's kind of motivated them to, to look at what they can do. So amazing, and Hannah, your idea about finding your why. I really love that. Do, do you feel that uh, sometimes the young people that we kind of, obviously the, at school and things, are sometimes still finding themselves. Do you find that young people sometimes struggle to find that kind of that reason, that, that kind of centre inside them? And if so, how do you help young people to kind of get hold of that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
it's definitely something that young people struggle with. I think a lot of people, no matter what age, dealing with what that kind of resounding why is and like the thing that gonna that is gonna motivate them to take action. And the only thing I can speak to from personal experience is to just go out and have experiences and go out and speak to people and engage with people and engage with the topic and don't put pressure on yourself to find this, you know, this why, but allow it to come to you and really do that through, yeah, just being compassionate to yourself on this journey because it is a lot um, and know that even just engaging in a really interesting conversation, you are having influence and you are, you know, engaging with providing solutions to the climate crisis, whether that be, you know, having a difficult conversation with a family member or speaking with your friends. Um, your why doesn't have to be this really grandiose thing. It can be as simple as a really potent conversation that you have with anyone in your life, as an example. But yeah. Amazing. I love that. I love how everyone seemed to talk about keeping it small, keeping it local, keeping it personal, rather than trying to kind of change the world. And I can't remember who it was who said it about the fact that often young people now seem to think that unless they have a grand stage, or we all feel a bit like that, don't we? Unless they have a grand stage, it's not worth doing. And I think that's really, uh, really such a strong point. Um, so I don't keep everyone forever. I just wanted to do a shameless bit of promotion. as something that we are doing uh, with, as the Surrey Network with, um, with, um, uh, with Zero and Guildford, actually. I'm just going to share my screen for just a moment while I find this so um a conversation with ben that um francis uh mentioned uh, a, a while ago who's the kind of the founder um he asked us to build a interactive uh, display to potentially go up in zero and that sparked a conversation with our group um with, about how we might do that and how we might and that very quickly turned into a conversation about climate positivity and how we could promote positive things that we were doing to show people that we were doing stuff but didn't have the problems of a kind of social media and uh um Dan, so you you kind of uh talked about that as well but we didn't get all that negativity so um from that we've just started to build a little mini kind of a uh, website using google sites um and i've rather presumptuously called a billion imperfect activist taking this idea that every day about a billion young people go to school every day so what we're trying to do here and hopefully this will be able to go up is we talk a little bit about what we do as our network and i don't know uh, i know jess is here but this idea i the one thing i found most inspiring is the network that we are part of to feel like you're part of something bigger is is been so incredible um so anyway what we're doing at the moment is we're each of our member schools is going to get a little set of slides and on that they are going to it's going to rotate around constantly and just show people all of the wonderful things that all of our different schools are doing and as this builds it will get bigger and bigger and more complicated i expect so at the moment i've just put in a couple of our cranny schools that are part of this but just all the great things that we're doing and all the different schools in surrey and um, and so if there is any schools here anybody here is not part of our network or is interested in joining this please uh, get in touch with jess or myself and we can help to be part of this and the only other thing I wanted to show is, uh, Caroline, you'll see that I've outrageously stolen some of your research for this. For this page about uh, climate positivity, as I found this, um, um, uh, we wanted to talk specifically to the idea of climate anxiety. And uh, that's um, taking your research, I think, Caroline, for, and Nature did an article about it, and that's one of their infographics on that. I think that's right anyway. So anyway, the survey that you've built is on here and it, when this goes live, it will be able for anyone, whoever wants to, to, um, uh, uh, to enter those things. And as they put in, it live updates on here. So I just wanted to show this as a, an idea of the questions that you guys uh, sample to today are already starting to contribute to this. So we wanted it to be something that young people could feel that they could touch and interact with and look at and kind of have their their opinions and their ideas shown so hopefully i mean it's not perfect yet and it's still in a development phase but actually we're really excited that we will be able to kind of try and infuse and engage young people to do this and actually dan the last thing that you talked about strangely enough just today i started to add a page about positive climate news 
and thank you for your sub for, there's only one thing in here so far but actually we're going to put in uh all of these different and have an aggregator of basically different positive news sites so if anyone's got any kind of great articles and all those sorts of things um we're going to put that up um so that's yeah that's just a bit of self-promotion of, of something that we've uh, been inspired to do on the back of working with our local heroes as i call them zero and actually from this and today, there's a whole load of new stuff that we can put up there uh, that we can build into this. So thank you so much for all your contributions.